Acts chapter 6, Choosing Leadership. Uh, we're going to look at the first 10 verses of a short chapter here, and that'll kind of launch us into the life of Stephen uh, for next week and his uh, uh, eventual arrest uh, and uh, a brilliant uh, uh, defense of the faith that he gives before the Sanhedrin, uh, culminating in his uh, becoming the first martyr of the, uh, of the church. But uh, we've been looking at the church and learning principles about the church as we go through the book of Acts. And um, certainly they were, they were consistent in prayer, we've said. Uh, they held to the word of God in fellowship, the breaking of bread and so forth. Uh, but even with this church where things are going so well. Let's look back at uh, where we left off last time in chapter 5, verse 42. And it says, And daily in the temple and in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Uh, the church at this time would be estimate between 20 and 25,000. In other words, there's tremendous growth going on. Peter starts out, uh, it's pretty much just him and the boys, the, those in the upper room, uh, 30 or so people. Uh, that's a lot of growth in a, in a very short period of time. Uh, that brought with, this, uh, with it some problems. We're going to enumerate uh, four of them uh, for you, which then left uh, them to realize that uh, problems were opportunities. I don't know if you tell your kids that or not, but uh, problems are opportunities, and uh, uh, and we're going to see how they dealt with uh, the problems. Now, the problems have been external in terms of persecution uh, against the uh, the believers. Uh, it's uh, it's gone to the extent of Peter and John being arrested and released. Uh, now all the apostles being arrested, uh, given a defense before the Sanhedrin, uh, and been taken out and beaten. And we've talking about the 39, either with a, a rod or with a, a leather whip. Uh, they didn't walk out. They crawled out. Uh, a lot of people died from that beating. The Apostle Paul says he went through it three different, on three different occasions. Uh, but it still didn't stop them from getting out and preaching uh, the gospel and continuing to minister to the people uh, there in the temple area and, as we see here, from uh, house to house. Verse uh, 1 of chapter 6 begins by saying, now in those days, uh, and it's uh, meant to be a contrasting term in the Greek. In English, we might say, but. In other words, all of this great stuff is going on. Uh, they're persevering through uh, uh, what uh, would uh, certainly diminish a, a lot of people's zeal for the gospel in terms of being beaten. Uh, but it hasn't, and the church has continued to grow. But now in those days, something different is happening here. Uh, there's a problem that arises within the church and uh, we're going to, uh, to look at it now. And in the process, get introduced, as I mentioned, to Stephen. And we'll try to mention Philip as well. Because these two young guys here in this portion of Scripture kind of get launched into ministry. Uh, and they become both players uh, big time as, uh, as we continue our study in Acts. Well, the first seven verses, uh, the problems become opportunities. Now, in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied... There arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Then twelve, the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word, and the same pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, uh, Procurus, uh, Nicanor, Tim, Timon, uh, Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles when they had prayed. They laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. So, Again, the, uh, problems uh, could have divided the church here, we're saying, and I've mentioned there's four of them. One is, uh, I've already mentioned the growth. Uh, to go to this kind of uh, tremendous growth uh, certainly was a, a, a blessing, uh, but it, uh, it, it creates uh, a lot of inherent problems because uh, you do still need, uh, need leadership. And uh, sometimes, unfortunately, and I, I've seen it uh, just even talking with uh, a good friend of mine, on the mainland that uh, started a church, and all he did is put out a sign that said Calvary Chapel, and 200 people showed up the first week. But to his, he was shocked, and uh, and within two months they had 500, and it just kind of kept going uh, from uh, from there. And uh, the problem was then you end up sometimes leadership by default, 
uh, just because you just got to have somebody to do that job, that position, and they've got to have, well, they're going to give them some authority and so forth, as we'll see here. It's not always the best way. Uh, they're trying to make sure they don't have leadership by <coughs> default. They're going to lay out some very careful qualifications for it uh, in, uh, in choosing people. But actually, sudden and quick growth is actually a problem uh, for ministries and for the church. It could have divided the church here, but it's dealt with properly. Secondly, the problem came about because the widows uh, were being overlooked. And it's not widows generically. It's the, uh, the Greek-speaking widows, the Hellenists, as opposed to the Aramaic or Hebrew-speaking. Within Judaism, keep in mind that uh, uh, they did take care of the widows. But they took care of the widows specifically, those that didn't have any, any, any sons. Uh, all the inheritance went, went from son, from father to son, father to son. So if, you, if you, your husband died uh, and you've got three girls, you're in a lot of trouble uh, because nothing can be passed down to you. Nothing can be passed down to your daughters. And uh, uh, at least uh, uh, materially in terms of what uh, crops and fields you might have normally had to produce income from your family, uh, you just didn't get. So the Jews set aside then a way to provide for them. And, and uh, you were all probably familiar with the story of, uh, of Ruth, and Ruth comes back with her mother-in-law, Naomi, and, uh, and they're in that predicament themselves because the husbands died, both sons have died. Uh, so now Ruth is out in the fields gleaning uh, because there was a system set up so that as they harvested the crop, they kind of had to intentionally leave a portion behind for other people to come and collect who, who needed it and so forth. Uh, difficult life, difficult situation. And that's what we have here in the concern uh, in the church early on. Uh, add to that two other elements. Uh, we've already mentioned that. We know historically there was a famine in Judah in the first century. So things are not good for anybody already. Uh, and then add to that, uh, uh, they are probably being ostracized from their families because they place their faith in Jesus as the Messiah. And the church is 100% Jewish at this point. So when it makes reference to the Hellenists uh, and it makes reference to, to the Hebrews, it's only talking about language. They're all Jewish. Uh, but the problem in the situation was is when you came to faith in Jesus as the Messiah, if your whole family didn't come at the same time, then you were put out from the family. And in that context, that usually meant your job. Uh, it might even meant where you lived uh, and so forth. It didn't, it didn't mean that you didn't get invited to the next bar mitzvah, it was a little more complicated uh, than that. Uh, and so these widows uh, felt like, the Greek speaking ones, uh, that they were being not really, they were getting the short end of the stick. We can use that figure of speech uh, when it came to the daily distribution. Now even that phrase is kind of interesting uh, because it's daily. Traditionally, it was weekly. Uh, weekly, there would be a distribution and normally of funds. When it says that the, the, the apostles didn't want to neglect the word of God to wait on tables, uh, the word for wait on table, if you put that uh, in the Greek and you put it over a, a commercial building in Greece today, it wouldn't be a restaurant, it would be a bank. Uh, the distribution was fun. So we get that waiting on tables and you picture these guys with uh, you know, uh, white aprons tied around their, their waist and carrying the, you know, the apostles running around like this. No, they weren't, uh, they weren't waiting on tables in that sense. Uh, the widows were coming in. Normally it would be weekly to get a distribution <laughs> to help them during, uh, during the week uh, to get through. Uh, it's daily here, which would make us think that is probably not just funds, or there wasn't the funds. They were actually probably bringing in food and distributing it because it was a dire a kind of situation because of the famine, because of their faith in Christ, uh, and so forth, uh, because they didn't have sons that could provide for them. Uh, because uh, And then they felt like they were... They were uh, not getting uh, all that they should uh, because they were Greek speaking. Uh, so thirdly, we say the problem is a language problem. Uh, now, whether the problem existed or not, we don't know. Were they actually, were they actually the Hebrew speaking, again, uh, the Jews from, uh, from Jerusalem and from Judah, were they really discriminating against other Jews or they're all brothers and sisters in Christ, all this is all brand new, brand new happening to them. Are they really discriminated against them? No, it may have just been perceived. 
I don't know if you've ever been in a foreign country and you couldn't speak the language. <laughs> there, there's a lot of perception that maybe you're not getting what you should be getting because you, and you can't really say anything about it. Uh, so were there, I have a tendency to think they weren't being discriminated against. I have a tendency to think it was mainly a language barrier, uh, and certainly that was one of the problems there. Uh, but uh, again, just keep in mind the fact that what the church is doing here is what Judaism had always done. Uh, Judaism had always cared for the orphan and for the widow. Uh, Judaism had always cared for the disabled. Judaism had always cared for uh, the down and out in society. Uh, and that uh, early church is Jewish, and all of that continues to carry on exactly the way it is uh, during Judaism. Sometimes we refer to the Judeo-Christian, and we fill in the blank, work ethic, uh, generosity. You know, we could uh, fill in the blank a lot of different ways. But every, a lot of what we do and why we do it is all based on the synagogue and, and what the church was like in this uh, very early setting. Uh, and it continues today. Now, uh, just to give you another reference to that, Paul says to Timothy later in 1 Timothy 5.3, Honor widows, honor them who are really widows. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. So first and foremost, families take care of families. But there are going to be situations where others do uh, need help in the church, uh, as it was in Judaism, is supposed to be there. And uh, in all of this, again, uh, uh, just brings this phrase to mind, a conversation I had some time ago with somebody uh, and I made reference to the church and being in the shopping center and, and, uh, and uh, this person, not, not a Christian, you can tell by their remark, uh, says something about, oh, those Christians. And it was you know, obviously meant to be uh, kind of a derogatory, those Christians, because uh, uh, we're not big on the, uh, uh, the, the media list these days and so forth. Nobody's extolling us and everything. When in reality, when in reality, uh, they, uh, they actually should. I, I couldn't help but remark about those Christians. Yeah. Those Christians, yeah, those Christians. You know the one that starts started all the orphanages, uh, the ones that are caring for uh, all those kids today in Africa with AIDS. Uh, those orphanages that started organizations like the Salvation Army, which is one of the best, best uh, drug rehab programs we have in the state. State, thank God for them. Those Christians, that, and I could just go on and on. It's those Christians out of Judaism that care for the disenfranchised, the down and out, as in contrast to first century AD, when the Romans, when they didn't want a child, a baby would throw it into an open field and hope an animal would eat it during the night. That was the Romans. But the Christians would run out and watch and grab those children, take them in their home and raise them for themselves. It was a powerful witness to a lost, excuse me, a lost in a dying world, those Christians. Uh, and it hasn't changed. Uh, a man named uh, Gunther Louie, L-E-W-Y, from the University of Massachusetts, a few years ago wrote a book called Why America Needs Religion. Now, what's interesting about it is that he is not a believer at all. He's a secular guy. And this is not the book he set out to write. He says he set out to write a book called Why America, America Doesn't Need Religion. We just need to get rid of these religious types. They're, uh, they're, they're killing us, you know. It's those white male Protestants. If we could wipe them off the face of the earth, all would be good. So says a lot of our singing anthems, media, movies, and, uh, and, uh, and so forth. I always felt very uncomfortable being in concert settings as a wild teenager and hearing that kind of songs coming up front because I was one of those white males sitting in the audience. But uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, you know, this guy sets out to write one of those books. And he says his research forced him to change his thesis 180 degrees, his research. Because he said uh, Christianity uh, historically been the strong support for human dignity and social justice. He also discovered how faith makes a difference in the lives of so-called, what he called, weak-minded people. He found that Christians exhibit measurably lower rates of marital conflict, divorce, prejudice, out of wedlock birth, juvenile delinquency, adult crime, and other, quote, indicators of moral failure and social ills. And it goes on and on. Changes his whole position. Why? He actually looked at the facts and the influence that the Christians have had on the Western, on the Western world. 
There was another book that came out just a few weeks ago, off the top of my head, so I can't give the uh, the author. Uh, but uh, it was very, I just thought it was fascinating because uh, this guy writes a book trying to compare why in third world uh, country settings where you've got countries in, uh, in Africa side by side, one is flourishing and one is not. One is doing great economically, one is doing great in terms of literacy and so forth, and the, and the very same conditions exist environmentally and so forth right across the border, but they're not. And he noticed this in different places around the world. And the conclusion that he came to in his research, the difference was Protestant missionaries that had gone out in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and the 50s to share the gospel. Where the gospel had gone, people had a work ethic. There wasn't the same kind of corruption in government. They had more stable families. And as a result, their kids had better educations and they did better economically and so forth. Now what's interesting about that is that you have people on the left that ridicule the Protestant missionary uh, and how he's robbed people of their culture and, uh, and so on and so forth uh, around the world. So this kind of research goes slap in the face against it. Uh, and it's been the Christians throughout history here beginning uh, with the traditions of Judaism carried over into the church as we see from the quote from Paul to honor those that are widows carries into the rest of the epistles in the New Testament church. And, uh, and so it's a problem, it's a situation, but it's a problem they're, ga they're, they're uh, trying to remedy here. <laughs> they're not just saying, well, tell them to buzz off. You know, uh, they're like, no, we need to deal with this situation. We've had tremendous growth uh, in the church. There's going to be problems here. Uh, there's a problem because we're kind of diverse. We're all Jewish at this point, but we've got people that uh, are Greek speaking. We've got people that uh, are Hebrew or Aramaic speaking. Uh, and so the, the language creates a, a problem as well. And then fourth, the problems came about because the ministry of God was being neglected. That's in verse two. Uh, then the 12 summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Uh, and we've already mentioned uh, this idea of what serving tables means. Uh, and so really what these guys were doing was probably distributing finances, although it could have been real food. I mean, it could have been goods uh, as well. But notice the word serve tables and the word ministry of the word are the same word. They just both mean serve. The idea of the disciples, the apostles are saying is that we have a ministry and there are other ministries. And we're not extolling one ministry above another ministry. We're just saying we have a calling to do a certain kind of serving in terms of teaching and ministering the word. And we believe there's other people that have a calling who are able to handle and deal with finances and some of these other things uh, that uh, we can't really do both. If we try to do too many things, uh, we won't be able to do the very thing that God has, has called us uh, to do. And again, uh, we, uh, uh, it was, I think, D.L. Moody that said, uh, it's, it's better to have uh, uh, 10 men that can do the work of, of, uh, of, one, of uh, uh, one man each rather than have one man that can do the work of 10 men. You know, sometimes we think, man, that guy's awesome. He can do the work of 10 men. But Moody says, you're better off just having 10 normal guys. Uh, and uh, often heard it said, you know, in terms of uh, leadership, and of course these principles apply not just for the church, but in the business world as well. Uh, that uh, uh, if you have to do something alone, then do it alone. But if you can do something with somebody else, then do it with somebody else so they can learn how to do it themselves. Uh, so this is all about uh, delegation here. Uh, and we see, secondly, uh, the problems we're seeing as opportunities. Uh, they saw it as an opportunity to... Uh, to uh, create more ministry, to make some changes, to reevaluate their, uh, their priorities. And uh, they were able to do it. And they set new priorities for themselves. And they saw other people raised up in ministry. Secondly, they saw it as an opportunity to exercise faith. Uh, it says, whom we may appoint over this, uh, this business. They had to put some, some faith and trust in these seven guys that they're going to raise up. They're going to mention some qualifications. They're certainly concerned, uh, especially in this area of finance and so forth. Uh, they're going to try to do their best to make sure they, they get the right, uh, the right guys in place and everything. Uh, they're going to have to put some trust and some faith uh, and exercise some faith in them uh, as well. Uh, and as I mentioned, what's, uh, what's awesome about this is that two of these guys 
just end up being raised up in the ministry here, but their ministry goes way beyond this idea of just handling uh, a little bit of finances and so forth. It goes way beyond that. We get Stephen, of course, we'll talk about more next time, uh, the first martyr of the church, uh, but uh, we are also introduced to Philip. Philip has a, a huge role to play. Of course, we'll find Philip up in Samaria leading a revival. God sends him down to the Gaza Strip where he leads uh, uh, the uh, Ethiopian eunuch, a uh, very rich, successful businessman to faith in Christ. Uh, he goes back to North Africa uh, and the Coptics, which are being persecuted for their faith right now in Jesus Christ, trace their spiritual ancestry back to this man. Uh, Philip has a, a huge uh, ministry. We'll see him more in the book of Acts. But it all begins right here. Uh, you, you just never, never know. And we've certainly uh, seen that here as we were kind of doing uh, worship uh, here in the second service at the beginning. And I was thinking... Uh, about uh, our good friend Robin, who when he was here uh, working with the, uh, with the uh, FAA and, uh, and always had a heart for missions and so forth and went on a couple of short-term trips with us and began a home fellowship and uh, God raised him up as a, a teacher and so forth. And he went on to another, uh, another duty station uh, after, uh, after this, finished out his time with the uh, FAA. Uh, his uh, kids were living uh, in, uh, he was in California, kids are living in I want to say Alabama and um, Alabama, Mississippi. Excuse me, but uh, uh, it, uh, in the South, in the Deep South. And uh, anyway, he'd never planned on retiring there. But I mean, when you've got only a few kids and you only got so many grandkids, so uh, he uh, they moved down to be near the grandkids. And of course, they got down there, and uh, there wasn't a Calvary Chapel. They were driving an hour hour fifteen minutes to get to a Calvary Chapel. So he started a home fellowship. Well, it's a church now. Uh, but uh, so Robin's, you know, down there, planted a church, pastoring a church. Uh, but uh, it was, it's neat to see the little connections along the way, how, how we kind of got raised up in the ministry and, and uh, started teaching the word here, uh, plugged into uh, the church there in, uh, in Fremont, I believe, in California, Northern California, uh, oversaw their missions program, uh, went through some other training, and then, you know, didn't know, but the Lord was uh, aligning things for him to be involved uh, in planning and, and pastoring a church. Uh, and that's what we see here. Uh, the disciples aren't raising up and naming Stephen and Philip because they know God's going to do great things for him. Name Stephen, he'll be the first martyr of the church and give a brilliant discourse before the Sanhedrin. They don't know that. They're just seeing a guy that's uh, full of faith and trusting the Lord. And let's, let's have a little faith in the guy and, uh, and see what the Lord will. It takes some faith to turn things over to uh, other people. Uh, but they were willing to do that. And uh, I love, that's one of the things I loved about uh, Calvary Chapel is uh, I just saw Pastor Bill do that all the time. Always looking for the opportunities to, uh, to not hold ministry uh, in and to himself, but constantly trying to give ministry away and ministry opportunities to, uh, to others. They also saw it as an opportunity to uh, express love. Uh, if you look at the names of these uh, seven men uh, that, are, uh, that are raised up here, uh, you note that they all have Greek names. Uh, Stephen, we, his name is actually Stephanos, or it's where we get our English word diadem or crown. And certainly, we could say Stephen <coughs> did and would wear a crown, the crown of the martyr. Uh, but they've all got Greek names. So you've got a problem, uh, whether it's uh, just a perceived problem or a real problem. Uh, there's a problem uh, based on language and so forth, and uh, maybe a perception. Is there a prejudice here? Well, let's make sure that no one thinks that or ever believes that. How do we resolve that issue? Put seven guys that are Greek over the whole thing. The, the Greek widows uh, think that they're getting uh, uh, not enough in terms of the, the finances of the church. Let's put seven Greek guys over it and let them handle the whole thing. No one's going to look at it again and go, <laughs> go yeah, I... I don't think there's any prejudice going on here. You've got seven Greek guys overseeing it. I don't think the, the gals are going to be complaining again after that. Again, whether that was really going on, I personally doubt it. I think it was more perceived than anything else. But I think it's brilliant, and I think it's done in love. Uh, it's like we don't have to have our guys. Uh, we can just get, we just want godly men. Uh, we don't care if they went to the same school as us, if they were raised in the same town with us. We don't care if they even have Hebrew names. Let's see if you've got seven guys that are full of the Spirit. Uh, this would be perfect because we're not only concerned about the widows, we're concerned about our perception, and we're concerned about our witness in the entire community here because there's a lot of eyes on us. 
I don't think this is being politically correct. I think they were just using a, a lot of wisdom, and they were able to find godly men that were able to do it. Uh, thirdly, about the problem, well, it brought an important decision. <laughs> they gave instructions. Uh, they are, what's being uh, uh, done here is the, we'd say, the office of a deacon is being established. Uh, that term is, uh, is not used uh, overtly here, although the, uh, the noun form uh, of the Greek diakonos is used here in Acts 6.1. Uh, it's a word that can be translated administration. Uh, uh, dia, diakonio uh, is translated to be served or to serve. Uh, and uh, it becomes, by the time we get to the epistles, an official position in the church. And we've got uh, further, uh, again, descriptions and qualifications for a deacon uh, later in Paul's epistle to Timothy. Uh, and then it expands. It's no longer just guys. It's gals as well. Uh, Romans 16, 1 says, I commend you to Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant, uh, that's our word, deacon uh, of the church in Sincrea, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she's been a helper of many and of myself also, Paul says. So by the time you get churches being planted and growing throughout uh, uh, Asia Minor and so forth, uh, you have not only the office of a deacon really established and qualifications given for it, uh, uh, more enumerated than we've got here, uh, but uh, they include uh, women uh, as, uh, as well. Now, uh, I know one question that maybe comes to mind then, well, how about Calvary Chapel Winberg? Who, who are the deacons here? And I always, when people ask me that, I always give the same answer. They're the people deaconing. If you want to see them, come very early on a Sunday morning. Uh, they're the people running around with vacuums and dusting and uh, taking things out the, out the back door. Uh, if you can't make it up early enough, uh, then stay later, and you're going to see a, a bunch of other people deaconing as well. Uh, we just don't, uh, you know, uh, if there was a need to give an official designation and title, uh, we would do it. Uh, but... Uh, we're not big enough. We, we don't need to do that. It's just a little more organic. Uh, people just jump in and serve uh, as, uh, as the Lord leads, and they see a need, or they ask, or what can I do? Hey, we need some help. Do it right here. Praise God. You know, begin deaconing. Uh, at the same time, we do have uh, an official <laughs> board of directors because that's the legal terminology we're required to have for the state of Hawaii uh, and for our 401c3. We have guys, uh, in this case, guys that are officially delegated uh, for overseeing uh, all of the finances of the church. It is a big responsibility, and so they, they have that title. We just don't give them little name badges to wear around and uh, put the little gold plates uh, you know, uh, in a certain place where they, they sit every week, reserved for, you know. Uh, we don't do that. They're just uh, the guys here, uh, uh, Tom and Lane, that are uh, faithfully serving serving in the Lord. And I can tell you, they would never arrive at that position if they weren't doing the other thing. <laughs> if they weren't taking the garbage out and serving and doing that other stuff, they'd never be, they'd never meet the qualifications uh, for, uh, for handling and being responsible for the finances. But it is a big responsibility. Uh, so we follow the structure, and there needs to be some structure. Somebody said to me one time, I don't know that if I, I don't really care for the organized church. I said, well, you prefer an unorganized church? <laughs> you know, like, things have got to be somewhat organized, you know, just for us to be able to function and, uh, and, uh, and do, uh, do what we do. You know, we, we actually required people when they were painting the hallway to use the proper color yesterday. <laughs> you know, I think that's a, we don't just, no, any color you want, just go for it. We're all just kind of free here. No, we're pretty organized. Flat paint in here, satin paint out there. It's got to be the same color. And uh, if you're not a painter, don't walk in here with a, a bucket of paint. We're going to reserve that for people that actually do that on a regular basis. But uh, uh, organization, uh, we're pretty organic about things. But as the need arises, uh, there's a need for some structure. But we don't need to overstructure things. I, uh, I can remember, I'll go ahead and say it. When we were still meeting in the Seventh Day Adventist Church, we were there for about uh, uh, 12 years. They were they were highly structured. Uh, and uh, I'll give you an example. At one point in time, uh, in the back Sunday school room that we were using, it was pretty large. It was this huge room, and, and we needed uh, 
we needed smaller spaces, so we wanted to put in a, one of those uh, uh, soundproofing collapsible uh, room dividers for them. And they're not cheap. They cost about three grand. And then uh, one of the other, we had to uh, you know, put in a header for this thing to hang on and kind of structure it so we could uh, get it installed and so forth. So we're, we're, trying, to give, we're trying to give them a $3,000 room divider uh, and install it, uh, install it for them. Well, we had to have a written proposal first. Uh, and it had to go to their uh, board of directors, but they only meet once a month. Uh, and so at the board, they thought that might be a good idea, but they didn't really have the jurisdiction to make that decision because that needed to go to the Sunday school, or of course, in their case, Sabbath school committee. So it was deferred to the Sabbath school committee. And they only meet once a month, so they had to wait till the next month. Well, they appreciated the fact we're gonna give them a $3,000 uh, room divider and uh, install it for them for free. So they thought that was a good idea. So they passed it along from their committee back to the board of directors, which only meets once a month. So now we had to wait for that next uh, meeting. I'm not exaggerating. Uh, it took three months, three months to get permission to give them the, uh, the room divider. Uh, they were quicker when we wanted to re-roof the whole Sunday school thing. They, they, they learned and that one came quicker. But the first time we wanted to try to do something for them, it took a while. We could overstructure things as well. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, guidelines are here uh, are great. Now notice the qualifications. Seven men of, of good reputation. Again, is, it, is a seven a magic number? I don't think so. Uh, you know, uh, one author said, well, it's a daily distribution. There's seven days a week. Maybe there's seven guys for a reason. You know, they didn't want to burn anybody out. but. Uh, it's, you know, as the need uh, arises. Uh, their uh, qualifications are there to be known. That is of a good report. Uh, uh, that word uh, can mean witness. It also can mean to look at diligently. So uh, they've got to be men or women that have a good reputation that you've looked at carefully, uh, especially in this category of, uh, of uh, handling finances and, uh, and, so, and so forth. Uh, we're probably not going to do a background check uh, for you to be able to vacuum uh, before, before church. But, uh, but we are if you're uh, going to maybe be working with the kids or something. You know, different, different things call for a different and a looking at. But they looked at uh, do they have a good reputation uh, in, uh, with the believers and in the community to look at diligently. Secondly, they're full of the Holy Spirit. Again, which is to be the normal Christian life. This is a person that's controlled by, uh, by the Holy Spirit. Uh, their lives are not uh, perfect, uh, but the habit, the general habit of their lives is to be controlled uh, by the Holy Spirit. And again, these qualifications get uh, enumerated on in 1 Timothy 3. Uh, they're to be full of wisdom. This means they have uh, common sense. We, off, we like to say that, uh, unfortunately, common sense is no longer common. And that's because common sense is actually taught. Uh, it's taught, usually in the context of, uh, uh, of the home. Have you ever met somebody that's really brilliant uh, and has no common sense at all? I like to bring that up because I'm, I'm not either. But, uh, uh, but you know, it's, it's just funny when people are super smart, but, you know, you know have, uh, you know, trouble, you know, left shoe, right shoe, or whatever it is, you know. It's, uh, uh, but common sense, uh, that, that's the idea. Uh, things are reasonable. Things, things are, are, are logical, uh, is the idea of, uh, of full, full of wisdom. Uh, and, of course, Stephen had all these qualifications, uh, and it says about him that he also was a man full of faith as well as and the Holy Spirit. So Stephen's life was, had a fullness of the spirit of wisdom. Uh, again, that word fullness means to be controlled by uh, and, uh, and full of, of faith. And certainly... Uh, we would see the outworking of his life being full of faith uh, in terms of, well, he was willing to die for his faith. Uh, he's going to become the first martyr of the church. And then lastly here, uh, the problem, dealing with the problem allowed the word of God to spread. Here's the results in verse 7. Then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests were obedient uh, to the faith. So uh, the word of God is spreading. Why? Because the apostles, who are uh, primarily at that point the primary teachers, they're discipling other guys 
as fast as they can. But these, these 12 guys are the primary uh, dispensers of God's word at a church of uh, 20 or 25,000 people and growing. Uh, and they were uh, given over or able to give themselves over completely uh, to that particular task uh, and not be caught up with a bunch of admin stuff that was uh, uh, happening that was uh, uh, vital and necessary. Uh, but it just didn't, uh, they just didn't need to do it because they could raise up and delegate it to uh, other, other men and women. And then just to mention here this idea of the priest, uh, the priest getting saved. It was quite a statement uh, uh, given a, a couple of things. About 20,000 priests in the first century divided up into 12 courses. Uh, and um, even according, as we mentioned before, even according to, uh, to Judaism, uh, this is a very dark time in terms of Judaism. The priesthood was completely corrupt. Most of these men were greedy and immoral. Uh, they're bad guys. They the, uh, are the ultimate hypocrites. Yet they're getting saved. They're coming to faith uh, in Christ. Uh, and I think they're... Uh, you know, there's a couple of uh, obvious reasons for this. One is that they all, they all would have been quite aware of the illegal trials that Jesus was put through. They know the law of God. Uh, they also know and have heard the reports of his resurrection. And they all, many of them were standing in the temple because they would have been on duty during Passover when Jesus died on the cross and the veil in the temple that separated <laughs> them from that uh, holy of holies. Uh, they saw it rent in two from the top to the bottom. That'd be hard to deny. And um, of course, every time they went back to serve after that, as their course was uh, scheduled to go in, they would see where this thing was uh, uh, sewn up. Uh, a separation, an opening has been made, at least symbolically, between God and men, between them and their access to God, and they witnessed it. But they stayed in their corruption, and they stayed in their immorality, and they still lived their lives of greed. Uh, until the Holy Spirit got a hold of their lives. But I want to suggest that, that the, one of the ways that that may have happened was the, was the sheer beating that the apostles went through. As priests, they would have been uh, keenly aware of the torture chamber that uh, lied within the, uh, the, uh, the downstairs of, uh, of the home of Caiaphas, the very place where the trial was held for Jesus, where the apostles were. They'd be quite aware of all of this. Uh, beaten to a pulp, they, they crawl out on their hands and the knees, and as soon as they get a strength, they go back in the temple and they're preaching about Jesus, and he's the Messiah, and he's the only way to salvation. He is our Messiah. He's the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 that came to die for the sins of the world. And apparently it was all too much uh, for, for these, these guys. Uh, we live in a, a, in a world where people are looking for the real deal, the real, the real witness. And there's, uh, uh, in, in contrast with uh, what uh, is referred to sometimes as uh, uh, fanatic Islam, where uh, there are uh, men and women and sometimes children uh, that are willing to uh, die uh, for a lie, uh, for something that is not truth, uh, sometimes people wonder, uh, are there Christians willing to do the same? And yes, there are, and they are doing it around the world. I, uh, I was reminded of this by uh, one of our missionaries that was serving, uh, uh, this is a few years ago, four or five or six years ago, and was actually in a, in a Muslim country, and obvious reasons, I won't tell you which one. Uh, but they were serving there, uh, one of our guys, uh, and at the same time, there was uh, a, uh, a, a guy in that country who had kind of uh, arisen in the Western press in terms of a story about him because uh, he was a Muslim born in that country and he had come to faith in Christ. Now he had been arrested uh, because, he, uh, because he was illegal in that country. Uh, and given the laws of that country, uh, if he was found guilty, then he would be executed uh, for his uh, faith uh, in Jesus Christ. Uh, so that, you know, our State Department picked up on it and stuff. And so, it, you know, we had Christians around the world, you know, praying for this guy. And, of course, we're praying for his, we're praying for his release, right? We're praying for his release. You've got uh, people in this country and other, uh, other countries, Christian countries, uh, saying, hey, you know, we'll sponsor him. We'll take, we'll take his family, anything we can do to help and so forth. Anyway, so I was talking to our, our missionary, and I was saying that, yeah, well, he said, are you aware of that, this guy? And I said, yeah, we're, we're aware of the situation. We're kind of praying for him and everything. He said, what are you praying for? Well, we're praying for his release. He goes, that's not what we're praying for. Really? What, what, are you, what are you guys praying for? Well, we're praying for God's grace to be upon him. 
And that when he stands trial, and he won't get out of this somehow, and some Western power diplomat might come in and scoop him out and take him to some Western country, we're praying that he'll stand trial. And he'll give evidence and a great testimony for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're hoping then he'll be executed right on public television. Everyone will see it. And everyone, every Christian in our country will know this is a faith worth dying for because we're going to heaven for all eternity. That's what we're praying for. What are you praying for? I wasn't really thinking along those lines, I have to tell you. It's a little different, isn't it? Uh, when, you're, when you're in those circumstances where there is persecution and how much is our faith really worth to us? Man, when you get a bunch of Jewish priests in the first century coming to faith in Christ, uh, I, I think it's more than eloquence that spoke to their hearts. <laughs> I think it's uh, the dynamic power of God's spirit, but also the dynamic power working through God's people willing to do whatever it takes to get the gospel out. That's what we started. We started seeing that persecution last week, and certainly uh, this is going to culminate, I would say, in a beautiful way, as you'll see through the life of Stephen next, word, next week. But the result is the word of God uh, spread Secondly, just to introduce us uh, briefly to, uh, to Stephen here in a couple of verses, verses 8 to 10. We're calling him the partner of Christ, and as we get to know him, you'll, you'll see why. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia disputing with Stephen. Uh, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Uh, again, Stephen's ministry was not limited to the church. Uh, he was out evangelizing, uh, winning the lost. God, uh, and again here, uh, we see this uh, power to do miracles bestowed on somebody that is not an apostle, uh, but uh, God's given him the ability to do uh, miracles here to arrest people's attention. They might hear the gospel. Uh, and of course, his testimony uh, that uh, culminates in 60 verses of chapter 7 uh, will be the climax of the last final witness before the Sanhedrin, who is uh, rejected and rejected and rejected. Uh, they're going to hear it one more time very brilliantly through Stephen. Uh, after that, we're going to see the, the gospel then move beyond Judaism uh, into the Samaritans. And so we're going to see a revival up there read as, uh, led, as I mentioned, by Philip. Uh, and eventually then uh, Peter going to the house of Cornelius, uh, uh, Gentiles being saved, and of course in the ministry of the Apostle Paul will come into focus. But uh, this is Stephen uh, that will give this last final uh, message to the uh, official leadership there in Jerusalem. Uh, first we'd say his partnership is seen uh, as being full of grace and power. Uh, the synagogues of the freedmen are uh, basically Jews that had uh, been at one time in some way or another in bondage to Rome. They've either been able to work, uh, purchase, or through a benefactor get out of that and uh, gain their freedom back. Uh, they are, uh, again, more the Hellenistic or Greek uh, from uh, this, uh, uh, you know, uh, they're from, uh, Stephen's from Cilicia, the same town that Paul was born in. Uh, we can... We don't know, we can speculate as to whether Paul was there, uh, whether Paul hears the full discourse uh, or not. We know in the end he's there and he's holding the coats and giving approval, it seems like an official approval from the Sanhedrin uh, to the death and the stoning of Stephen. Uh, but uh, we're going to see that uh, uh, Stephen is a man full of, full of grace as well as truth in the way that he delivers the, uh, the truth of the gospel before the Sanhedrin. Uh, which makes us think of the description of Jesus uh, in John 1.14, who came full of grace and truth uh, as well. Uh, again, Stephen's life is so uh, merged to the life of Christ uh, at this point, uh, uh, very, very early on, uh, obviously, in, the, in his life in the, as a Christian, in the life of the church. And uh, secondly, we would say that uh, this partnership is seen in, uh, in a lot of different ways. Both of them are filled with the Spirit. They preach with great wisdom, and they both work wonders uh, of Christ and Stephen. Both are falsely accused and brought before the Sanhedrin, uh, and they are both said that uh, uh, they came or spoke against the law of Moses in the temple. Uh, both statements false, of course. Both had false witnesses brought before them. We'll see that next week. And both 
uh, is probably the climax to everything in the life of Stephen, is that at his death, even as the death of Jesus, he is, as he's being murdered, he is forgiving those who are murdering him. And of course, one of those uh, people uh, holding the coats, watching, listening to everything, is a man named Saul of Tarsus, a very hardened persecutor of the church, uh, and God is about ready to get a hold of his life. Uh, but you have to believe that the impact of watching somebody be martyred for their faith had a tremendous impact upon uh, his life to turn a hard, bitter soul like Saul of Tarsus uh, into uh, one of God's kids and uh, end up being the apostle who would give his own life for, for the church. Spurgeon once said, there is none in heaven wearing a crown that did not wear the cross below. Uh, and certainly uh, Stephen is one of those guys that wears the cross below and wearing a crown uh, today uh, in heaven. So problems in the church. Uh, but uh, these guys uh, deal with it. I'm sure there was a lot of, a lot of prayer that went along with it. Uh, they apparently picked the, uh, the right uh, seven guys. So important to have uh, godly uh, leadership at any level of, uh, of, the, of the church. And, uh, and certainly uh, we're exhorted over and over again to pray for those in authorities over us. And I, I would encourage you to, uh, as I often do, to, uh, to pray for myself and for Lane, for Tom, for Gary overseeing Sunday school. Uh, there's just a lot of things going on. I, I, I thank the Lord that uh, the ministry here is not limited to what I can do. If we, if we did, we, would, uh, we could have a lot of Bible studies, but uh, uh, I'm not sure that uh, much uh, would really progress. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I always love it when, uh, when there's ministries happening and I have nothing to do with it. <laughs> I, I, I love that, you know, the, you know to, went down and did a little devotion with the, with the kids at the Casas Academy on um, uh, days that kind of blur together. I think it was before I got sick, really sick, so I think it was on Thursday morning, but I went down and uh, uh, it was just a blessing just to see what's, uh, what's going on with, uh, with the kids and uh, down there in just uh, different ways. You know, Kathy and I meet with the youth group on, uh, on Friday, uh, on Friday nights and uh, uh, we, and we just, you know, we probably should get somebody else to do that, but we just, for the time being, we just love, we love it. We just love being with the kids, and uh, they're, uh, they're hungry for the Word of God. They have such great uh, friendships together and stuff. It's just uh, very cool, very, uh, very refreshing. And uh, so we just, you know, pray the Lord would continue to, to use us and to, uh, to raise, raise others up, you know. Uh, if uh, you see a light bulb that's burnt out, uh, you know, uh, write a, yeah, a formal requisition, a little bit, just try to go down the same way and buy a bulb or something. You know, see, we're just not, uh, we're not formal about uh, a lot of things. If, uh, uh, you know, if you, uh, you have some time, you want to do something to, to serve the Lord in a more tangible, regular way, uh, hey, let us know. We'll find uh, something for you to do. Uh, but uh, just, you know, come in on Sunday with the, uh, the attitude, is there to serve? Is there some way uh, you're, we're here to, uh, to worship God and bless God, and we're here uh, as best we can to, to serve uh, each other? If, if you come in with the attitude that it's all about me, we don't, do we sing that worship song? It's all about me, Jesus. Uh, sometimes we come in singing that song, uh, and, uh, and it's all about me being blessed, and, and I can tell you, you're not going to get blessed. <laughs> but if you'll focus the attention off of yourself uh, and on to the Lord and on to what you can do to help somebody or bless somebody or uh, bless, make somebody's day, uh, encourage them in some way, uh, then you'll, you'll be the one that's truly blessed by, by the time the day's, uh, day's over with. Uh, it sounds very basic, uh, and it is, but it's very, very true. Uh, but we live in a, in a culture that is all about me. Uh, we're out there every day with people saying, uh, "Get your, you can have it your way." <laughs> you know, even the even the, the McDonald's will, you know, uh, seek to bless you if you come in their front doors. You know, uh, everything is about you and what we can do for you and so forth. And businesses are, you know, service oriented, uh, but we can almost get to where we anticipate being on the receiving end of things all the time, and forget about that. Our life in Christ is now given to Him, and it's to be given away to. Uh, to others, filled with the Holy Spirit to overflowing 
that others might experience what we have through Jesus our, ourselves. Amen? Hallelujah. I made it through this. <coughs> You're saying, like, that all seemed pretty normal to me, but trust me, it really wasn't. <laughs> uh, let's pray. Uh, Lord, we thank you that, uh, for your word and just how it teaches us and instructs us. And we don't have to in invent the wheel. Uh, you give us guidelines for uh, really everything that we do. But not so much, Lord, that we don't need to uh, be listening to you and living a life of dependence uh, upon you, Lord. So we, we just lift up our own lives that we might all learn to be deacons, to be servants uh, of you, ministering. Lord, in, in whatever way and capacity, different places, different uh, gifts that you've given, different talents, Lord, uh, but uh, what a glorious thing when it's uh, used for, for your glory and for your purposes. Lord, we find real true meaning and purpose. People are looking for that. They're, they're dying to know, is, is there real meaning to this life? Is there real reason for it? And yes, there is. To know you, to be able to worship you to be able to serve others uh, in your name. There's nothing nothing greater than that. We've all got to earn a living, got to pay the bills and live in this life, but life's got to be more than that. Lord, so we're thankful for all that you give us in Jesus Christ. Pray your blessing upon us as we go now in his name. Amen. All that I was in ruin behind you swept away by the winds of your life still the sadness remains when I consider the price you paid for my heart 